Good evening, everyone. It is such a delight to be with you again. Uh, tonight, we're doing something quite special and appropriate for spring because we're all getting back outside. And uh, tonight's program is Call of the Wild, which makes me want to howl a little bit. So if you want to howl with me, you can. Oh, oh, a little wolf howl. This program takes place on the traditional territories of the indigenous signatories to Treaty 7. And that includes the Blackfoot nations of Siksika, Bigani, and Gaina, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda of Bears, Pachiniki, and Wesley First Nation. We also walk in the footsteps of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We are all treaty people. May we live with respect for this land and between all nations. Now what I'd like to start with are buffalo, deer, and antelope. And uh, this song seems pretty much tailor-made for our theme of the wilds. Mm -hmm. just go right into springtime in the Rockies. When it's springtime in the Rockies, I'll be coming back to you. Little sweetheart of the eyes of blue. Once again, I'll say I love you. While the birds sing all the day. When it's springtime in the Rockies, in the Rockies far that's very short so let's do it again and you can sing along with me when it's springtime in the Rockies I'll be coming back to you little sweetheart of the mountains with your bonny eyes of blue once again, I'll say I love you as the birds sing all the day. When it's springtime in the Rockies, in the Rockies far All 
right, now I'm going to head into my first story. This story is about the wilds and it's about springtime in the mountains, in the Rockies. My husband and I love to hike. It's one of our favorite things to do. And uh, this particular year, a few years ago, we got very ambitious with our first hike of the year. We were going to do Centennial Ridge, which is in the Kananaskis, but it's not an up and back kind of hike. It's a traverse, which means you start at one trailhead and you end up at a completely different trailhead. So you need somebody to drive you to the, to the two places. So my parents were quite willing to do that. So they dropped us off at one trailhead and my husband and I headed up. It was a beautiful day and it was forecast to remain a beautiful day. Now, as we climbed, we were challenged because the whole hike, well, it is the equivalent of climbing a 440 story building. That'll give you some idea of the elevation gain. We stopped frequently. It was one of our first hikes of the year, so it was very challenging. So finally, we got up to Mount Allen. But then we encountered a problem because coming down the Kananaskis Valley were very large black clouds. We quickly had our lunch and wondered what to do. The rest of our hike, well, a good portion of the rest of it was across a plateau, not a good place to be in a storm. And then what made it worse is we started to hear the lightning strikes. So thunder boomed through the sky and we knew we were in trouble. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't head in the direction of the plateau. We would have been in, in the way of the storm, but we didn't know how to get off the, the mountain any other way. Just then, a couple popped their heads up as we were sitting having our, our lunch, our quick lunch, and they said, oh, hello, how are you? And we said, well, we're worried. There's a storm moving in and we don't know how to get off this mountain. Well, the gentleman said, no problem, I can help you. I used to work on this mountain. I was one of the technicians who would go and check the weather reporting equipment on the mountain. We were so relieved. They had a quick bite to eat. The storm was moving in, more thunder. We could see the lightning starting in the sky. And we all started off together as a foursome. And the gentleman said, it's very good that we're all together as a foursome, because if one of us gets struck by lightning, then two can administer CPR and the other can go for help. Well, then I was truly terrified because I was waiting to get struck any moment. But he headed down a slope that I didn't even know existed. And he led us out through the forest safely to the trailhead. As we were going, we got soaking wet. The storm passed over us. By the time we got to the other trailhead, my parents were sitting in their lawn chairs waiting for us to come down. That day, I was so grateful for the kindness of those strangers. And that's the end of the story I call Escape from Mount Allen. So I have another song for you now that is called Land of the Silver Birch. And it's a beautiful song. Uh, many children sing it when they go to camp. And, uh, and it's, it's really, truly lovely. And it's about yearning to be in the wilds again. Land of the Silver Birch Home of the beaver, where still the mighty moose wanders at will. Blue lake and rocky shore, I will return once more. Boom diddy atta, boom diddy atta, boom. High on a rocky ledge, I'll build my wigwam close by the water's edge, silent and still. Blue lake and rocky shore, I will return once more. Boom diddy atta, boom diddy atta, boom. My heart 
grow sick for thee. Here in the lowlands, I will return to thee, hills of the north. Blue lake and rocky shore, I will return once more. Boom de dee a da, boom de dee a da, boo. Swift as a silver fish, canoe of birch bark, or mighty waterways carry me forth. Blue lake and rocky shore, I will return once more. Boom de dee a da, boom de dee a da, boo. next story is also a true story, but it's not a personal story. It is about other people, but it's absolutely true. It happened. I call it Race of a Lifetime, and it's based on a newspaper article I found about this incident in the wilds. Now, Jordan, Achille, Gabe Dawson, and Mac Holland were three friends in Idaho. In July 2013, they decided they wanted to raise money for their local food bank. And they thought the best way to do that would be to take a trip. And they decided to do a charity ride from Idaho all the way up to Alaska on their bikes. Now they were well on their way into the Yukon territories on the Alaska highway. When Jordan and Gabe, well, they ran into some minor bicycle troubles. And so they had to stop and make some repairs. Mac Holland decided he would continue on. He knew his friends would catch up in no time. And so he pedaled on and pedaled on. He had gone several kilometers down the road when he heard panting behind him. And he thought for sure his friends had caught up. But when he turned to look, he saw that he was being chased by an animal. Now his first thought was, that is a really big dog. But then the animal lunged forward and snapped at his heel. That's when he realized his pursuer was a wolf. Immediately his adrenaline surged and he changed gears and darted his bike forward as quickly as he could so he could grab his bear spray that was sitting in a holster on the front of his bike. He got the bear spray off, managed to get the safety off of it, and then turned it back towards the wolf and sprayed. The wolf got the full spray right in the face. It fell back about 20 feet and then huffed and shook its head. Well, Mac Holland thought, that is a wild story. I'm glad that's over. But the wolf was not deterred. He raced forward again, and this time he snapped at the tent bag on the back of Matt Collins bike. And in fact, he tore it. And now there were tent pegs and tent poles all over the highway. Well, he had to keep going. He kept pedaling and pedaling. And every now and again, he would send another burst of spray into the wolf's face behind him. But the wolf only ever fell back a few meters and then surged forward again. Mac Holland thought about his wife and his three beloved young daughters back home in Idaho, and he wondered if he'd ever see them again. Well, the other thing that kept running through his mind was a fact he knew about wolves that wolves run down their prey until they're tired. Well, the wolf was on his tail the whole time. He felt his lungs ready to burst. His legs were exhausted, but he had to go on. And then to his horror, he saw ahead of him a steep hill. And he knew he would not be able to sustain his speed to stay ahead of the wolf on the hill. The highway had been very, very quiet, but suddenly at the top of the hill, 
At the corner, he saw an RV coming. Quickly, he made his plan as the RV came towards him. He got the bear spray ready and he sprayed the last of the spray, a big cloud, big cloud of pepper spray into the wolf's face. And the wolf, it just happened to veer into the ditch just a little bit. The RV came towards him and squeezed around because the RV driver knew exactly what was going on. And he stopped between Mac Holland and the wolf. And Mac Holland jumped into the cab of the RV. The wolf tore that tent bag to shreds and then sat over the bike as if the bike was its kill. Soon other people arrived in their cars and people began to honk and to shout at the wolf, but he didn't move. Finally, someone threw a metal water bottle at the wolf and he did slink off into the forest after that. Mac Holland got out of the RV and he was shaking and felt the adrenaline finally draining from his body. The woman who had been in the back of the RV, well, she came to him and she gave him a big hug. And that's when Mac Holland broke down and began to cry from this horrific experience. Now you'll be happy to know his bike was okay. The tent wasn't, but his bike was okay. And his friends did catch up with him. And the rest of their charity ride, which Mac Holland was determined to finish, went off without a hitch. And you can imagine that that reunion with his wife and three daughters in Idaho after it was all over was a very joyous one. And he would never forget his wild ride through the Yukon when he encountered a wolf. If you know it, sing along. Mm. is wild in a different way. It's about wild flowers. This is a story, it's an old folk tale that I have adapted to my own home, home, home country of the Netherlands. And it's called the Delft Blue Pot. Long, long ago, there was a young girl named Annika who lived with her parents outside the city walls of Delft in the Netherlands. Now there aren't too many hills to speak of in the Netherlands, but 
Annika and her parents lived at the top of a rise above the old Delft Canal. Annika's job every day was to bring water up from the canal to help her mother with the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry. Annika's parents were potters and so when Annika was young they had helped her make two pots for this purpose of bringing water from the canal back up to the house. After the pots were fired in the kiln, well, Annika painted them. She painted one Delft blue and the other tulip red. And on each of them, she painted beautiful wildflowers, lilies of the valley, roses, snowdrops, and bluebells. She did this important work every day as she grew up and during this time her parents got older and Annika got older too. She was still strong and capable and her pots got older too. But she continued to do her job with the pots. But one day, one spring, early spring day, as she was loading the pots onto the stick that she put across her shoulders to carry the two pots full of water, she noticed that the Delft blue pot had a little crack in its side. She picked up the pot and she ran her finger gently over the crack. And she said, oh dear little pot, Will you be able to still hold my water? She decided that the crack wasn't too big and that she could still use it to haul the water. So she went down to the canal as usual, filled the pots to the brim, attached them to that long pole that rested on her shoulders, and she began the walk back up to her house. But when she got to the house, when she looked at the Delft blue pot, she saw that it was half empty. Half of it had leaked out through the crack. But she decided there was enough water still to do the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry. Well, this went on the entire spring. She would go down and she would collect water in the pots. She would put them on the pole, carry them back up the hill to the house, and the Delft blue pot was always half empty by the time she got to the top. But she examined it every now and again and she, she thought all was well. But what she didn't realize was that her artistry and her love had given the pots a life of their own. And the Delft blue pot was miserable. Every day it was carried down to the canal. It hoped, it wished that the water would stay in its belly after it drank it. And every day when it got to the top of the hill, it was half empty and it felt terrible, but it wasn't doing its job. One night in its shed in their resting place, the two pots sitting side by side, the Delft blue pot wailed I'm no good. I'm just no good. I'm really no good. And the red tulip pot said, be quiet. Nobody wants to hear from a pot. But the next day, the crack was even wider on the side of the Delft blue pot. And that day after he had been filled and was climbing with Annika back up the hill, he said, Annika, I have tried to serve you well all these years, but I'm no good anymore. I'm useless to you. Annika, for her part, looked around, wondering where the voice was coming from. It was not one she recognized. She looked down the hill and called out, hello, but there was no one there. Then the pot said, it's me, it's your Delft blue pot. I'm no good anymore. I've got a crack in my side and every time you carry me up the hill, I've lost half my water. Well, Annika looked down and she couldn't believe her pot was speaking to her. 
And she was delighted to know that her pots had just as much life as she had always imagined. And she said to the pot, my Delft blue pot, you have not been paying attention. She said, look at the pathway on the hill. And the pot looked and on the right side of the pathway, the pot saw a ribbon of color, beautiful flowers. Annika said, I knew that your water leaked out right from the beginning of the spring. And so I planted wildflower seeds all the way along the pathway on your side of the path. And each day as we climbed back up, you watered those seeds. And now you have created a beautiful ribbon of color with lilies of the valley and roses and snowdrops and bluebells. And the pot was overjoyed. Finally, the pot knew what Annika always had. It doesn't matter how old we get. We can still add beauty to the world. One more quick story and, uh, and then one more song. So this story is called The Wolf and the Dog. So we have another wolf story for this Call of the Wild show. It's an Aesop's fable. There once was a wolf who walked along the edge of a town. He was half dead from hunger. He happened to run into a dog, a, a town dog. And the dog looked at the wolf and said, oh, cousin, I knew how it would be. You with your irregular life, well, it'll be the death of you. Why don't you come with me into the town and get yourself a regular position and then you would get fed as I do? Well, the wolf said, I wouldn't object if I could find such a situation. The dog said, fine, you can come with me and my master. Well, he will feed you too if you do some work for him. And so the dog and the wolf began their walk through the town to the dog's home. But as they went, the wolf noticed that there was a wide swath of fur missing around the neck of the dog. And he asked the dog about it. And the dog said, oh, that's nothing. That's just where I'm chained up at night. It chafes a little, but you quickly get used to it. The wolf said, friend dog, I am not going with you for I would rather starve in the wild than to be a fat slave. And this is the perfect song to go with it because it's all about not being fenced in. Lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me in. Let me be by myself in the evening breeze. Listen to the murmur of the cottonwood trees. Send me off forever, but I ask you please. Don't fence me in, just turn me loose. Let me straddle my old saddle underneath the western skies. On my cayuse, let me wander over yonder till I see the mountains rise. I want to ride to the ridge where the west commences. Gaze at the moon till I lose my senses. I can't look at hovels and I can't stand fences. Don't fence me in. Don't fence me in. Don't fence me in. Don't fence me in. 
And that concludes my Call of the Wild program this evening. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed my stories and songs, and I hope to be with you again soon to do even more.